When you see a data set or a model, there's always a host of questions to ask. That's why linear models are great. That they make it very easy to ask all these questions. They let us spend our time thinking about the phenomena we're trying to model, not about the mechanics of making the model work. If we can design the right features in our t into our linear model. That's what we'll talk about in this video. How to design features so that linear models answer the questions we want answered. This video will be a gallery of several different tricks. Let's jump to the first. It's called one hop coding. Here's our old friend, Ronald Fisher's famous iris data set. This plot shows petal length on the y-axis and sepal length on the x-axis, and each dot represents one row in the data set, the measurements from a single iris. I've color coded the dots here according to which species the iris is. You, you're probably looking at this and you're thinking, hey, it's roughly linear within each species like these dotted lines that I've drawn on the plot. Well, to fit those straight lines, we could just split the data into three separate chunks, one for each species, and then use basic algebra to fit a straight line. But we're data scientists and we're machine learners, so we're going to do it the fancy way. We're going to ask, can we do it with a linear model? This isn't just a frivolous thing to want to do, trying to be fancy for the sake of it. It's really useful to be able to express this sort of pattern as a linear model, because then we'll be able to compose it with other patterns, as we'll see in later, day, later examples. OK, so we want to fit three straight lines, one for each species. Let's write this as petal length is approximately alpha subscript species plus beta subscript species times sepal length, or I'll abbreviate, let PL be the petal length and SL be the species length. The point of this is there's an alpha coefficient, the intercept term, and a beta coefficient, the slope term, for each species. In other words, there are six parameters we're trying to fit. Alpha setosa, beta setosa for the setosa species, alpha versicolor, beta versicolor for the versicolor species, and alpha virginica, beta virginica for the virginica species. There's a different alpha and a different beta for each species. So let's try to write this as a linear model. Here I've written the response vector, petal length, on the left-hand side. And we want to write down a linear model. So we want to approximate petal length by a linear combination of features weighted by parameters. That's what a linear model is. Let's just think about the first row of this model, for example. Let's suppose it happened to be species Setosa. We want our approximation to say that petal length PL1 is alpha setosa plus beta setosa times sepal length 1. So there needs to be a 1 in the top row of the first feature and in the top row of the fourth feature to capture the alpha setosa and beta setosa terms and the rest of those vectors need to have 0 in the top. And just looking through the other rows, this is what the features have to be. This first feature, if I want to write it in a more mathematical notation, would write it like this, one subscript species equals Setosa, which we refer to as an indicator function. I'd read it as the indicator that species equals Setosa. And in this thing, species is a vector. And for the beta Setosa feature, we can write that one out as a binary vector too, multiplied pointwise by the sepal length numerical vector. This strategy is called one-hot coding. We've taken the species vector, where each row is a string, and we've turned it into three binary vectors, one for each of the possible values of the string. Whenever you have discrete data like strings or enums, and you want to turn them into numerical features, this is what you can do. You end up using this an awful lot in neural networks for natural language processing, where you need to be able to encode words or letters into numbers. Here's the code. The one hot coding in this code is done by the magic on line four. For each of the three species in turn, 
Satose of Versicola and Virginica, I'm using numpy.where to create a vector with ones in the rows of that species and zero in the rows which don't belong to that species. OK, so this is one hot coding. Next example, fitting nonlinear responses. We saw this fit before when we wanted to fit a curve. Remember, we proposed the formula petal length is alpha plus beta times sepal length plus gamma times sepal length squared. And this is a nice simple linear model that we've seen how to fit. Remember, linear means linear algebra in the sense that all of the orange terms that I write down here are vectors. It does not mean straight lines on a graph. What if we wanted something more than a quadratic? Well, we could, of course, just fit a polynomial of higher degree. As you can see, the higher degree the polynomial, the more closely it can fit all the wiggles in the data. The linear model for this is pretty obvious. We just say that petal length is a pet polynomial. Petal length is beta naught plus sum from little k equals 1 up to big K, beta sub little k times sepal length to the power of k. This definitely produces a wiggly line, which we may, we may well want to fit. But I think, generally speaking, I think this is a pretty crummy type of model because it just goes haywire outside the region where we have data. If, if we did want to fit an arbitrary shape with arbitrary wiggles to, to, to the data, here's a trick that I think is more honest. Here I'm fitting a step function to the data. Any guesses about how we could write this as a linear model? Pause the video now and try to think how you can use the tricks you've learnt so far to fit a linear model to this. This is my solution. I'm proposing the model petal length is alpha 4 times the indicator that sepal length less than 5, plus alpha 5 times the indicator that floor of sepal length is equal to 5, plus alpha 6 times the indicator that floor of sepal length is equal to 6, plus alpha 7 times the indicator that sepal length is above or equal to 7. Let's just think through what this model does by working through an example. Let's suppose we're looking at a row in the data set, row i, and this row has sepal length equal to 6.2. Then the model formula will predict that petal length for that row is alpha 4 times the indicator that sepal length less than 5, which is 0, plus alpha 5 times the indicator that floor of sepal length equals 5, which is 0 again, and so on. The only term that survives here is for the alpha 6 term, the indicator that floor of sepal length is equal to 6. The way I've written my model, I've got different features at the beginning and end. My first feature is the indicator that sepal length less than 5, which means that any flower with a sepal length less than 5 will get the prediction alpha 4. In other words, my fitted curve has constant value extrapolation to the left. Similarly, the right-hand side term says that I want constant value extrapolation on the right. The next example will be yet another illustration of the clever tricks we can do with one hot coding, this time for measuring differences between groups. Let's suppose we have two groups of measurements, let's say measurements of some quantity from two different groups of people. That's sometimes called two different conditions. Let's suppose that the first group has measurements x1 up to xm, and the second group, with a different number of people, has measurements y1 up to yn. Typically, you'd want to compare the groups. We could, of course, just fire up Excel and do the simple thing and find the mean for group A and the mean for group B and subtract one from the other. But let's be fancy data scientists here, and let's try to build a model for the entire data set. Again, this isn't just for the sake of being fancy, it's because this idea of comparing groups is a building block that we'd like to compose with other building blocks. For example, if we have two quadratic fits and we want to compare their offsets, then the naive straightforward methods will turn into hack upon hack upon hack. But if we think in terms of linear models and comparing groups, it's easy to just compose the various 
tricks that we're learning compose the various features we want into a single linear model and we don't need to think at all about how to get the estimates we want. But this data doesn't actually look too promising for linear modeling though, does it? Because these two vectors x and y have different lengths and how on earth can you put them both into a vector equation? The answer is, you don't. First, you need to put the data into a model-friendly format, and the way to think about that is in terms of database tables or spreadsheets. If I wanted to store this data set in a database, I'd create a single table with two columns, one column called condition, the other called value, and I'd stack the two vectors x and y on top of each other. Now it's easy to write out a linear model. A linear model will be that the value column is approximately beta subscript a times the indicator of condition a plus beta b times the indicator of condition b. Actually, this one's quite interesting because there are several different ways we could have chosen to write the linear model. For example, I could have chosen this formula. Value is alpha plus b to b times the indicator that condition equals b. This model predicts value alpha for everyone in group A, and it predicts value alpha plus beta for everyone in group B. So that means that the beta term is actually measuring the difference between the two groups. It's just as good a way to describe the data as the first model. It says there are two groups and each group has a different response. But it turns out that if we're careful, if we choose how to write our linear model, we end up with different interpretations of the parameters. We'll come back to the interpretation of linear model parameters in the last two videos of this section. Here's a nice extension of this sort of idea. This is a past exam question. This question is about psychometrics. Let's suppose we've asked a bunch of people to predict what each other thinks about certain topics. If we frame this in the right way as a linear model, we can pull out parameters that measure how perceptive each person is, meaning how well they guess what other people are going to say, and also how open each person is, meaning how well they can be guessed by other people. I won't go through the details of this, but you're welcome to give it a go yourself. For the next example of feature design, I'm going to come back to a data set that we've looked at several times already. Here's the climate data set showing temperature as a function of time. Let's suppose we want to fit a sinusoid to this data set. Here's a sensible looking model equation. Temperature is alpha plus beta times sine of 2 pi times time t plus phi. Where the parameters here are phi, which controls the left-right phase offset, beta, which controls the amplitude of the sine wave, and alpha, which controls the up-down offset. How would we fit it? This section of the course is all about linear models, so of course we should think about linear models and fitting it with sklearn's linear regression command in the usual way. Except, linear regression only works for linear models. <laughs> Remember the definition, a linear model is a linear combination of features weighted by parameters. We'd need our model to look something like this. Temperature is alpha plus beta times some feature E plus phi times some other feature F. And our sinusoid definitely doesn't look like this. The sine function itself is fine. We're allowed to transform the data however we want to produce our features. But the features have to be pure functions of the data without any parameters. And in our model, the sine of 2 pi t plus phi, it just isn't a feature because it involves phi, which is an unknown parameter. We could throw up our hands and say, this isn't a linear model. That's not actually a problem because we have tools to fit arbitrary models. We learnt in the first part of this course about numerical optimization. We could just define a function f that takes in the unknown parameters alpha, beta and phi, computes the residuals, the difference between observed temperatures and predicted temperatures from the model formula, and returns the mean of those residuals squared. Then just bung this into scipy's fmin command to numerically find the parameters that minimize the mean square error. We could do that, but instead I'm going to show you a nifty trick. 
that doesn't need anything more than secondary school trigonometry. So here's the model we want to fit. Temperature is alpha plus beta sine 2 pi t plus phi. And here's something you probably learnt years ago and thought you'd never need again. The double angle formula sine of a plus b is sine a cos b plus cos a sine b. We just apply this to our sine term and we get this alpha plus beta times open curly bracket sine 2 pi t cos phi plus cos 2 pi t sine phi, which we can just rearrange and get alpha plus beta cos phi sine 2 pi t plus beta sine phi times cos 2 pi t, which is now in friendly linear form. If I just define the coefficients right, beta 1 is beta cos phi and beta 2 is beta sine phi. If I could fit this and get beta 1 and beta 2, I could just use algebra to give me back beta and phi. So what we've produced is a linear model, alpha plus beta 1e plus beta 2f, where my features are e equals sine 2 pi t and f equals cos 2 pi t. We can just go ahead and fit it in the usual way with SK Learn's linear regression function. Now, there's something on this page which I hope is bothering you. If you haven't spotted it, pause the video and have a think. The problem is that this model is very suspicious. It says that temperatures follow a sine wave, alpha plus beta sine 2 pi t plus phi. But that's not a good model because this model denies the possibility of long-term climate change. Let's fix the model. It's totally easy to fix. We just take our periodic model and we add a straight line term plus gamma t. This is what I meant when I referred earlier to composability of linear models. We know how to fit straight lines. We know how to fit sinusoids. So to fit a sinusoid with a long-term trend, we just add the two together. We could have added a polynomial term if we wanted to model accelerating warming. We could have added a step function if we wanted to model an arbitrary warming curve. We could add anything at all. By the way, this um, non-periodic term here, for example, the plus gamma t, is called a secular trend. Secular means things that change over time, as opposed to the divine, which is eternal and unchanging except the divine, of course, is allowed to be periodic, like the liturgical calendar has a periodic pattern with Christmas and Easter each year. From this model, for this data, the answer comes out to be gamma hat is 0 0.0354 degrees centigrade per year. In other words, an extra 2.8 degrees C by the end of this century. If you look very, very closely at the two fitted curves, you can barely just about see the difference between them. That's really why we need machine learning. It helps us see the things that we can't make out with the unaided eye. There's a more interesting readout from this model though than just gamma hat. What we can actually do is find a confidence interval for gamma to learn how sound this estimate is. To do that, First of all, we'll need a probabilistic version of the linear model, which we'll come to shortly. And then we'll need a whole load of thinking about inference procedures, which we'll cover in part three of the course. Before getting onto that though, there's one thing to bring up about what we've just done. In this final model, we added a secular term plus gamma t because we suspected from our general background knowledge that it might be important. If all we had was the data, we might not even think to add it because the effect is so small over the time range that we've plotted. It's just 1.2 degrees C and that's easily swamped by the noise in the plot. So the question is, if we hadn't thought beforehand that that term needs to be there, how could we have discovered it? That's called linear model diagnosis and that's what we'll look at in the next video.